that little film captures nearly everything I want to say to you today. Um, if you want to watch it again, it's uh, on the ODI website uh, and, and on YouTube. I, and in fact, if anybody's listening online and couldn't understand parts of it because they couldn't see the subtitles, they might uh, like to uh, watch it uh, again. Um, on the table here, I've got uh, some of the reports which uh, um, covered this, this same reform, uh, um, and that includes some of the some of the numbers on the uh, impact of, of, of this particular reform. The, the, the numbers are quite impressive. So this is this is an example of a politically smart. Uh, reformist effort supported by, in part, by donor funds, which achieved a really big result. Um, <clears throat> first question that you might like to hear more about is uh, what were the ingredients of success in this particular experience? Um, and they're all mentioned in the course of the film, but uh, let me just uh, uh, run you through them uh, again quickly. First of all, you had here a, a team of reformers who um, settled on an objective that they thought would be really important for making economic development in, in, in the Philippines more inclusive, but which was also uh, politically uh, likely to be possible. They, in fact, rejected um, a, a proposal to work on the whole question of, of, of rural land ownership, which is um, very uh, difficult in, in the Philippines, and they targeted this other thing, which has important, important effects, but, but did not seem to be totally excluded by the nature of the political um, system in, uh, in the Philippines. Second, the team empl employed what uh, Jaime Faustino in the film calls a, an entrepreneurial approach. Um, uh, Faustino uh, is a uh, practicing uh, development worker, but he's also very well read on the, the literature on entrepreneurship and uh, business startups. And the principles he applies uh, uh, have been written up in much of the uh, writing about how firms like Google and Amazon got started in the first place. And the, 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 the entrepreneurial logic that uh, those people have applied involves, at the beginning, making a series of small bets on things that may work, things that may be a, a business success, or in this case, things that may work to 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 uh, lower the political barriers uh, to uh, a, a, a useful reform. And that's one of the things that distinguishes it from the typical way in which big development agencies support reform in developing countries, which tends to involve making one big bet. Um, uh, based on a, a detailed plan worked out in advance and then uh, implemented uh, over a period of years. So this is a trial and error approach. Small bets, see whether the bet pays off. If it doesn't, change course, try something else. If it does, pursue it, develop it. So as Hafarsina mentioned, I mean, that they, they had tried out at least two different variants of trying to reform uh, the property rights law uh, in uh, in the Philippines, and uh, one of them didn't work, and uh, um, the, the, and and in fact the team who had been pursuing that were um, were let go by the funding uh, organisation. The, the team which succeeded was this one, and they succeeded on the basis of a very simple uh, legal change, which uh, introduced an administrative procedure uh, for registering property in the place of, of, of what had been a, a legal procedure, which is very expensive and very corrupt. Um, thirdly, <coughs> as you saw, the, 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 the team uh, were a, a, a self-motivated group of, of, of Filipinos um, getting funding, in fact, uh, from uh, um, the USAID, the American uh, um, agency, and later from the, from, the, from the Australians, but having their own agenda and being largely self-motivated. Um, and that's really the fourth feature, although these are aid-funded uh, uh, initiatives, um, it, it, it's a question of putting a small amount of funding into the hands of, of, of um, a, a self-motivated group and the Asia Foundation, which was mentioned, is, is a, is a long-established uh, international NGO 
registered in California, uh, and that's uh, the organization that employs Jaime Faustino. The role of the Asia Foundation is partly to, 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 to uh, be an intermediary between the, the donor <coughs> organization and the, and the frontline reformers. Um, uh, and the role is that of uh, stimulating, encouraging, uh, challenging, it's a sort of peer review kind of uh, uh, function, or as Jaime Faustino likes to put it, it, it's like the role of a, of, a, of a football coach in relation to a team. So those were the ingredients of the success uh, of, of, of that particular um, reform. Um, what else has it been applied to in the Philippines? Well, half a dozen different uh, reforms which have contributed quite a lot to making to bringing the Philippines from being one of the le less successful Southeast Asian economies to, to becoming one of the reasonably uh, um, uh, successful ones. Um, the <coughs> other recent reform which is covered in our reports was uh, uh, involved uh, um, uh, raising the tax on uh, uh, tobacco and alcohol and channeling uh, the new tax revenues into um, uh, the uh, national uh, health insurance program subsidizing the, uh, the, the premiums of, uh, of, of, of poor people. But earlier, um, the same kind of approach had been uh, um, successful in, in, in bringing about legal changes necessary to liberalize uh, air transport and sea transport, which of course is very important to the Philippines because it's an archipelago. Um, and those were all supported by the same team uh, from the Asia Foundation with different alliances of, of, uh, of, of, of local reformers uh, um, doing, the real, doing the real work. Um, politically smart uh, in the sense that one of the things that the trial and error is about is discovering which politicians, which influence uh, interest groups uh, might be willing to support the, the venture, which ones are clearly opponents of the venture and somehow need to be disempowered. It involves a lot of working uh, under the radar, um, working by informal means, mobilizing social relationships, um, doing a lot of lobbying um, to find solutions to problems which if they were confronted sort of frontally through a big program financed by the World Bank, for example, would almost certainly have, have, have been fatal to the reform. How does this differ? How does this approach differ from what is more standard in, in the development assistance business? Um, it was mentioned in the course of the film that uh, um, there had been a previous uh, reform program on, on property rights in, in the Philippines, which had been very expensive and had achieved very little. Um, and that's, that's a rather normal pattern, in fact. A, a lot of donor funding goes into um, large programs which are intended to uh, improve the, the governance of a particular sector in a, in a, in a comprehensive way. Um, and these programs have a pretty poor record of success, according to most of the uh, evaluations that have been done by the World Bank and, and, and others. And the reason for the failure are partly because uh, those programs make the assumption that we know how to solve um, uh, the core problems of, of, of development and are therefore in possession of enough knowledge to design a detailed solution and increasingly it's being recognized that uh, the real world is not like that we don't know in advance how to get around the political obstacles to uh, um, developmental reform um, we don't know what are going to be the consequences of changing one particular um, uh, element in this situation because there are a lot of unanticipated consequences in the reform processes uh, in technical language, one says the problem is complex. It's complex, but there's a lot of uncertainty. And where there is uncertainty, the Big Bang reform, which pretends that we know in advance how to solve the problem, is not the way to go. The way to go is the entrepreneurial way, where you try something out, 
learn very quickly whether it's working or not and, 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 and make fast adjustments. Um, how widely does all of this apply outside of the Philippines? Um, the Philippines is a country, it's a middle income country with uh, a political system which is quite problematic from the, from the point of view of, uh, of development. Um, but it's not a low income country and uh, in many respects uh, um, Sub-Saharan Africa, which is the area that I work on uh, uh, mostly, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa is, is, is more difficult. So how widely could one generalize from, from this experience? Um, well, quite widely, and the, the, the evidence on this is still limited, but, uh, but, but growing all of the time. Um, there is another uh, publication on the ODI website, apart from these ones on the Philippines, uh, which I co-authored with, with Sue Unsworth, uh, which brings together um, a total of seven um, projects um, around the world, which are examples of this sort of thing. They combine the elements of being adaptive in their approach, um, being politically smart, that's to say being well informed about the political environment and being astute about what to do about the political environment, and, and thirdly being locally led. So the, the, the publication is called Politically Smart and Locally Led. And it includes the, uh, the experience from the Philippines, but also some, some four other uh, initiatives. Um, five other initiatives, actually four of which um, uh, uh, were funded by the FID, by the British agency. So um, this is something that is supported also by experience within the DFID portfolio. Um, and the, the case studies on this uh, are, are growing all the time. At the moment we're, we're beginning to work on two um, initiatives supported by DFID, which uh, are support to economic development, to, 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 to investment in economic development in, in, in two countries, in Nepal and, uh, uh, and Nigeria. Um, that will be coming out in, in, in a few months' time. Um, at the Kennedy School of Governance at Harvard University, there's a, a group of people who ha, ha, have produced a number of very interesting papers and books uh, over the last few years, which promote what they call uh, problem-driven iterative adaptation as an approach to policy making and uh, um, uh, in general developments uh, uh, interventions. Um, uh, Matt Andrews, in particular, has a, a, an excellent book on, on public sector reform experience, which um, supports the case that the, the ambitious Big Bang um, blueprint type reform uh, uh, programs um, have a very bad record of success, and an adaptive, uh, locally led ap ap approach uh, has, has a great deal of potential in reforming the civil service, reforming the management of, uh, of different sectors of the economy. Um, agencies like Belgian Technical Cooperation uh, have in them some people who have built up and documented experience of uh, an adaptive approach working in the reform of uh, districts, health services in places as difficult as the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, and drawing on all of this experience, uh, over the last couple of years, there have been a couple of uh, sort of international encounters um, uh, dedicated to doing development differently. And, and that, I mean, that phrase is being used to, to uh, as a sort of um, umbrella concept, embracing all of these elements of, 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 of new thinking, adaptiveness, small bets rather than big bets, local leadership of the initiative, and so on. What are the challenges? There are some. There are lots. Um, but one of them is about how exactly to operationalize the kind of thing that was achieved in the Philippines in environments that are that are different. Um, 
I mean, to my mind, it's quite clear one of, one of the strengths uh, of, of the reform approach that's been applied in the Philippines is that it's, it's relatively easy to put together a team which includes people who are technical experts in a field who have worked in governments in senior positions before uh, with people outside of government who are good at campaigning, good at research. Um, the, 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 the key to success in this field is the combination of the political smartness and the technical uh, knowledge uh, of, of, of the field. In most uh, African countries, the availability of people who have experience in government but are now not in government is, is, is more of a challenge. The Filipinos have the American, the North of the US style where, where, where each time the president changes, all of the senior civil servants change. For better or worse, you don't have that in many uh, um, sub-Saharan African countries. There are, however, slightly different models which meet the same need and, and, and Matt Andrews in particular has written about Uganda uh, in East Africa um, suggesting what's the way to go there to have the most chance of, of, of uh, uh, um, uh, achieving success with this basic approach. And it, it, it involves breaking away from the sort of classic way in which African governments confront reform uh, uh, challenges. Um, and it involves bringing in people from different ministries, different sectors of activity, including people who are charged with implementation of particular programs. And bringing them together with people who have the talent to think outside the box, to generate excitement, to deal with the political snacks. And to do that, you have to have political authorization, but it's possible to get that. Um, and Andrews is promising to produce a, a, a set of case studies of, of uh, success in Africa with this kind of model. Um, finally, um, the big challenge is to convince uh, funding organizations, including DFID, uh, that this is uh, something that they should take seriously and do on a large scale. Most of the experiences so far are on a relatively modest scale in terms of expenditure and the number of, uh, of, of people involved. And there is a, a perception that this kind of politically smart working is a sort of risky thing um, with uh, um, both risks of failure and, 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 and risks of, uh, of causing political embarrassments to, uh, to, to, to the development agency. As Jaime Faustino says in the film, actually this approach is not risky in terms of risk of failure. The, the risk of failure is, 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 is large with the, with the, the big upfront designed programs and not with the programs that uh, employ this entrepreneurial approach. Um, but there is a job of persuasion to be done uh, on this and there's certainly a job of persuasion to be done uh, on the point uh, that, that this can be done without causing embarrassment uh, to the donor. The donor agencies are in this country are uh, very concerned about what certain newspapers say about what's being done with the aid budget. Um, we need to be able to uh, um, design programs in a way that uh, does not uh, incur the risk that uh, the minister will be caused serious embarrassment by an article in the Daily Mail. Um, part of the uh, um, solution to this challenge is, I think, to develop uh, ways in which um, uh, the uh, uh, headquarters uh, of funding agencies can be uh, assured that the implementation of these programs is being done well, that it is in fact delivering on the, the learning that is uh, 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 central to the, uh, um, the, the, the approach, uh, and is in fact achieving good value for money, is achieving um, large results on the basis of relatively modest uh, expenditure of money. And I think that, and that's a program of work that uh, um, uh, we at ODI and uh, in organizations like IDD here um, are, are, are taking in hand. So, I mean, to conclude, this is a very exciting field. 
Um, I think if any of you are interested in going into international development uh, uh, professionally, this is something that you will want to want to pick up. Um, for those of us who can remember back to the 1980s, which includes one or two people here, um, this is not entirely new. The idea that development uh, uh, requires for success an adaptive approach and one which is politically smart uh, was a very prominent idea in the 1980s. But we're facing here a, a situation which is quite common in the field of development, which is that the, 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 the community of practice learns a certain thing, achieves a certain consensus about something, and then forgets it. So I've referred to all of this as, as new ideas. These are actually not new ideas. These are old ideas coming back in, in a slightly new context. But still, I think it's exciting, and I think the chances of, uh, of, of making big breakthroughs this time around are better than they were the first time around. But thanks. I'm very interested to hear what your further questions will be about this. Yes, I mean, the, the idea of the film is to, bring, is to com compact the whole thing down to 10 minutes. I mean, I'm sure there were lots of technicalities which were not gone into. Um, but one of the technicalities that you might be concerned about is, uh, well, you passed a law, but what about the implementation? Um, that um, is much less a problem in this case than it usually is. And Faustino uses the phrase self-implementing reform. Um, they very deliberately um, went for uh, a small legal change which would create incentives for implementation. And basically the incentive for implementation is that the the, the, the people who staff um, the uh, uh, local land registration offices who are charged with this, uh, um, th this task um, do take small bribes for doing the work. Right? And you need small bribes for almost anything in, 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 the, in the Philippines. Um, they therefore have an incentive to do the work. Um, that doesn't reduce the beneficial impact uh, very much because the bribes are very small compared with what formerly was being paid to lawyers to conduct the expensive legal process. So lots of techni uh, technical problems. I mean, I think the, the technical problems for uh, urban residential property are probably less than they would be in the rural sector. Um, but um, in the team, and they have specialists, this Owen Tiamson was a former uh, um, uh, secretary of the relevant area of, of, of government knows his stuff and also knows who are the players. And they very deliberately went around the major source of bureaucratic opposition to making a change. Yeah, next to you, back right. uh, yeah, uh, I mean, I think this adaptive strategy and formulas are I wonder if there's a sort of when you talk about the sort of cut through thing and when things fail, you just cut them off, you cut funding, get rid of the team. Is that going to move incentives to look towards short short term goals? And how do you expand that to more long term targets? Yeah, that, that, I, as I was saying that, I, I, I was thinking to myself, that sounds a bit cutthroat. <laughs> but I mean, actually, the, 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 the team that the Asia Foundation uh, sort of stopped funding at a certain point were a team of researchers at the university. I mean, they, they were not going to starve as a result of not getting this funding in, anymore. Um, it's, I mean, the, the whole program was not uh, uh, very long-lasting. I mean, I, th uh, I think this, this was all achieved in the space of about four years. 
Um, uh, some of the usual um, disadvantages of donor funding to civil society organizations in developing countries were avoided, um, partly because the organizations in question uh, already existed, they had other sources of funding, um, they were led by people with, with a certain track record going back, in fact, to the, uh, the anti-Marcos struggles in the 1980s. Um, so the, the, the funding didn't distort what, what, they were, uh, what they did with their time. And the fact that you had the Asia Foundation as an intermediary between the donor uh, agency and the, uh, and, and the frontline reformers also helped to sort of mitigate some of the normal perverse effects of donor funding. I certainly think that uh, uh, one of the things that, that Faustino is very good at is identifying people who are doing useful things and have bright ideas. Um, they don't necessarily have the solution, but, but then if you find the people who at least are thinking about the problem, then you can go with them through a, through a learning experience which does find solutions. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, thank you very much. That's really interesting. Uh, what sort of what what sort of country do you think? What sort of profile the country needs to be to where this system applies, where this approach would apply? We talked about the Philippines as an illegal country, and uh, I gather it's same stable and legal. So. Uh, I mean, according to the context, I mean, you'd, you'd have to um, adapt it a lot. Um, but the, uh, the, the, the set of case studies that Sue Unsworth and I put together uh, included um, a uh, livelihoods program in, 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 in rural India, uh, in Odisha. Um, a, um, demobilization and disarmament intervention in the Democratic Republic of Congo, which is certainly an unstable context. And there it was a question of, of, of a funder coming in and identifying a local organization which had sort of bright, unconventional ideas about how to approach demobilization and disarmament, which was different from the approach of the United Nations agencies. Um, and, and, and then supporting them and accompanying them through a, a learning experience. Um, so I, mean, I think the nature of the, of the of the local partner of the donor agency will be very different according to the context, but in principle, it's very widely applicable. I, I don't think it's it's especially suited to middle-income countries, and in some ways, if the uh, if the situation is very unstable in the sense that violence can break out again at any at any moment, that's an additional reason for making small bets rather than big ones. And learning very quickly, being very agile. I mean, being agile not just to protect your staff from 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 violence, but being very agile about what uh, what kind of thing you, you try out. Hi, um, I um, saw this video, and uh, what uh, what my mind says like it talks a lot about the human aspect of development and uh, about people really not being able to inherit the problem of children, and also uh, lack of security for, for people. Yes. Uh, so what I want to say is that there is also a very huge economic impact on this. So if you uh, make property rights correct, you can foreign direct investment and trade. So how about the MNCs taking part there and creating a uh, subsidiary? Uh, they are also actors that uh, can win something out of this. Isn't this true? I mean, it's not only the human task. <coughs> Um, the, the effect on, on, on economic growth of, of this particular reform would, would primarily be that people start investing in their property and they make nicer houses, and they paint them and, uh, and, and, and so forth. But um, among the other reforms that uh, um, the Asia Foundation has been promoting using this basic same method, uh, uh, the impacts are quite high level and, and involve, certainly involve corporate actors. Um, I mean, a lot of them are, 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 have, have contributed to breaking monopolies um, held by particular corporate actors, usually large Filipino business people with 
we, we, who, who are closely related to leading politicians, the presidents usually, um, and opening it up for a wider range of corporate actors, including international ones. The, um, the, the tobacco tax reform involved, amongst other things, challenging the, the monopoly position of the Philip Morris um, consortium and opening up tobacco to uh, other, play, other international players, as well as making tobacco more expensive to consume. Yeah, um, I'm going to follow up what you were saying about the possibility of scaling up the aid that's uh, spent using this sort of approach. And you talked about the risk management idea. It seems to me that risk in the business world works differently to risk in the political world. Uh, spreading your bets is a good method in the business world. In the political world, you have 100 small bets, 99 succeed, one fails. The Daily Mail reports the one failure, and it doesn't matter that it's a small bet, it's still embarrassing. So I wonder, I wonder if it, there's, there's, a, there's still a problem there in terms of incentives for aid agencies. And also I think DFID obviously is trying to spend more money with fewer people, so it's been driven towards bigger projects. Yeah. I wonder how you get over that, that dynamic if, if you're trying to push back to the smaller projects and then slide. I think I mean on the first thing, there there is a there is a process of reforming thinking in, in going on in DFID, not because of for, for us, but initiated from, from, from inside. Um, and they 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 have a set of, of, of what I call smart rules for um, contracting um, uh, development programs, which are supposed to take account of this kind of idea, I mean, it's, it's, it, that there there is growing recognition that uh, that a, that having a, a few things that fail on a small scale ought to be acceptable, um, and that uh, you know a robust defence of um, making mistakes in order to learn can be offered to the uh, to, to 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 the newspapers. Um, can you repeat the second bit now again? Just to, well, to we've remember. had a trend towards larger projects. Oh yeah, yes, yes. That, that 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 is definitely the case, and I think we have to face up to that. Um, uh, there needs to be much lighter um, defeat management and, and much more uh, um, um, contracted out to service its service provider organisations. Um, but I think there the the the, the trick will be to get the, the, the service provider organizations themselves to take on this, the, these messages and work that way themselves. And when they respond to a, 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 a tender, um, that they actually propose that back to, 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 to DFID, right? We are not going to work on a blueprint. We are going to take the, the basic outline of the project as you described it in your business plan um, and we're going to manage it in, in an adaptive way. And we're going to report on the basis of our learning, uh, uh, rather, uh, and in the end, on the basis of our results. But we're not going to uh, comply fully with the requirements of the log frame instructions of 2011. And there is an appetite in DFID for this now. So it's up to the service providers to actually come back and make that proposal. And we're talking actively to some of them about this. Uh, Fiona, you have a question? Uh, well, I think you've not answered quite depth my question already, actually. I was sort of wondering about the scale of resistance uh, within the uh, particularly in country advisors, perhaps, rather than at, uh, in, in London. But also, related to that, what about the governments in the recipient countries themselves? You know, they might prefer to have a bigger project, a reform project, and get lots of money and resources, and salaries, etc. So there could be resistance. Yes, I mean, I, 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 I don't think we, 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 we're committed at all to, to making projects smaller in general. We, we, we're committed to making the big projects uh, um, uh, take on board the idea of small bets. Um, I mean, I've, I've, I've sat in, in one meeting in Nigeria where both the DFID advisors and the, uh, some of the service providers who are running current programs were, were, were there. There was a very interesting uh, uh, exchange at one point where the, a representative of a service provider said, look, we believe in being adaptive, but uh, um, we, we're not sure that if it would, uh, would support us in this. 
And the different advisors come back and say, we would definitely support you in this. We're waiting for you to actually break this proposal. So in, in these respects, I mean, we, we are sort of pushing a bit against an open door. It's just a question of having the courage to, to actually go fully down this road in big health programs, big education programs, um, and support to economic development. Uh, if I could come back to you in a minute, but if, if I could jump in on that point, mm -hmm. you, you just mentioned a range of different kinds of uh, areas. The whole idea of this entrepreneurial approach of making small bets necessarily means sort of small scale innovations that can be tested, monitored, evaluated quickly, learning, closed learning, uh, very quickly closing your learning loops and then, yeah. and then going on from that. But one of the classic problems that we talk about in development a lot is that outcomes are long term, hard to measure, all these kinds of problems. That, uh, and so I wonder, I mean, do you think that this kind of approach can really be applied in all fields, or are there some areas where it's better suited or to being applied than, than not? Yeah, I mean, that raises a very interesting question. Um, uh, speaking here in the um, Governance Resource Center, which is whether governance programs are, are the ideal place to do this. I mean, a lot of the thinking um, has come out of uh, um, uh, organizations which see themselves uh, as primarily politics and government and, and governance organizations um, but actually I, th I think um, setting up a program as a governance program uh, should be avoided as far as possible because the the governance programs which have um, been supported by donors over the last 20 years tend to be based on the assumption that we know in advance what kind of governance a given country needs and therefore we can design a program to get them to accept this kind of governance and that's completely contrary to the findings of most of the comparative research about governance for development which which leads to the conclusion that What's appropriate, what works to produce development outcomes is very varied from country to country. There is no standard formula which works. We know that the Chinese have achieved spectacular poverty reduction with governance institutions which are totally different from the ones that are promoted by donors uh, throughout Africa. Um, so, although I, I mean, my unit at, uh, at, at AVI is, is, is the governance and politics uh, um, uh, program, but actually, I think we need to do less governance programming. And what we need to be doing more of is uh, programming which is designed to address some of the chronic uh, problems in development, economic, social, and uh, um, uh, political, um, but allow the program to learn what kinds of relationships including political relationships, actually work to solve those problems rather than solving, rather, rather than pretending that we know the answers in, in, in advance. And, and some people have been saying this for a long time. I, I mean, I mentioned the Harvard Kennedy School as, as one of the places where a lot of this thinking is, is being generated at the moment. Um, you know, one of the uh, more senior members of that school, Mary Lee Grindle, was arguing 10 or 15 years ago that we should be speaking of good enough governance, not good governance. And one of the things she meant by that was what works for development in, in terms of governance actually varies a lot from place to place. And it depends a lot on what stage of development uh, the country is, is, is at. Uh, we need to be much more modest about what we know about these things. Yeah, um, yeah uh, thank you very much for saying that I'm old enough to realize that this is not I wasn't looking at you for that. No, 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 you made <laughs> So that, that's just an issue there. Um, so I won't leave that. As someone who's worried about some of the informal settlement people in urban areas, I think there's some stories in the Philippines that aren't being told and support what uh, Andrew said around where tenants fit in. In some cases, not having legal title actually protects people from market forces that may then keep going and can actually be more counterproductive paradoxically. So I think there's there's you know I think there's still quite a long way to go 
you know, on that. Now it sounds very good, what's being done, but I just want to sort of kick up again the things that there is, as you know, quite a literature on this around citizen led movements in basically urban areas, particularly down in Italy and they have documented this and I use it to teach. And we tend to come to it, and then we ask the question, how replicable is this? And we tend to say, well, in some countries that may have a sort of degree of democracy, that may have a civil society, India, Philippines, South Africa, seem to be the ones that keep the approach. But where I get worried, to be honest, is this, is this, let's scale up. Let's scale up, and then let's do value for money, and then doing the HQ. And I suppose, I kind of almost want to put it that it's, um, I have a very strong gut feeling that these sorts of initiatives work really because they're sort of being left alone and that you can't scan them up. And if you do, you will, as it were, kill the, kill the golden goose. I haven't got it, I can't really articulate this, but I feel this very strongly, which would bring me, given if it's very well resourced, but possibly if it is the worst agency to be doing this at the moment, given some of its problems which is a desire to spend large amounts of money. Um, so, so one possible alternative, which is one that comes from the urban one, is to think more about supporting intermediate organisations that can actually do some of these things a bit easier, be a bit more flexible. Mm. So, sort of, in a sense, rather than different, do it, perhaps it should be funding more Asian Foundation. Yeah. Statement. So that's, sorry, that was more statement. I, I mean, I, I don't disagree with that, but... Uh, um, in the Philippines cases, an American uh, um, advisor in USAID and later an, an advisor in, in, uh, um, in AusAid um, knew that working through the intermediary of the Asia Foundation was going to uh, um, avoid some of the sort of classic problems that donors, uh, donors face. Um, I think DIFI can do that too, and in fact, the the uh, the examples from Nepal, hydro power investment, and uh, the program called Foster in Nigeria, which we've been talking to them about recently, both involve funding intermediaries. So the it, it, it's it's uh, very little of the money. In fact, I think in both of those cases, none of the money goes to the governments of the country. Um, uh, then they're not establishing project implementation units inside a ministry or anything of that sort. It, these things are going to intermediaries, which in some cases are styled as think tanks. Uh, in other cases, they they would count as civil society organisations. Um, working their intermediaries may may pose as some sort of limit to uh, um, to, to to the scaling up. In the Philippines case, the scaling up of this initiative would be largely a question of what the government does with, with this legislation, because at the moment, it, uh, I, uh, as I understand it, there's, there's sort of basically one office in, in Manila which is processing all of this stuff, and they've, they've been working on, on making sure that the, all of the provincial offices are able to do it, which would uh, change a, a, a large impact into an absolutely massive uh, impact. So I think, I mean, what scaling up means is different depending on what kind of problem you're looking at. And in many cases, that it it will be challenging. But the proposition will be there's nothing inherent in the approach which makes it impossible to do it at a significant scale. I think we have enough time for about two more questions. So one over here, and I'll take one more in the back. I was just curious about the language. Of, uh, you know, Felipe is fun. Um, from the countries I come from, sorry, not again, in Canada, I went to use the term politically correct. And to me, it sounds like it's a deliberate effort to bypass the formal institution that should actually be you know, used to bring about that fundamental change that in that institution. So, my concern is really about sustainability. How does that mechanism work? that adaptive approach diffuse within established mainstream institutions that must change the laws and change the policy in favor of those that require to get that support. I get a sense it's, it's more about bypassing the established system. And again, in Southern Africa, there is a lot of fatigue around violence. Uh, people are tired about 
is testing and retesting. Yeah. People want to see things done to scale and sustainable over the long term. So by passing the established institutional mechanism to me seems to be quite contrary to expectation that you see with building practice. Yeah. I, I, I don't think this is about bypassing, in fact. Um, uh, and it's, I mean, it's not about sort of wagering on supporting civil society instead of supporting the government. The, um, the, the methods in the Philippines and the methods that, that Matt Andrews uh, promotes uh, for use in sub-Saharan Africa involve working in government, but not entirely in government, right, in and out. And inside government, it involves working in a way which does not tie you up in the bureaucratic routines of the civil service, which have a justified reputation for killing off progressive reform. So it's a question of identifying the people in government who actually want to see um, solutions to chronic development problems, supporting them, stimulating them, and, and doing the whole thing with, with the necessary, necessary political authorization um, to achieve things which have not been achieved for many years. You know, really, really chronic problems. So not guilty to, uh, um, to, uh, um, to bypassing and not guilty to pilots either. And this is not the sort of classic kind of donor pilot project. This is making trial and error um, a sort of built-in uh, aspect of, 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 of the way you do work. And the method is, is, is actually, I mean, is recommended as what, the way governments should actually do their own business. But the reality is that they don't do their own business uh, that way. There's a lot of ideology about, about planning, which means producing a document which maps everything out and then leads to nothing. But the ideal is the governments pick this up as, as, as their way of working and, 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 the, and the second best is, is uh, that you get together teams of people who assist government to move in that direction. Um, I just sort of, you don't have to phrase it really, because the whole idea of being particularly smart and working with local stakeholders and political development, that exists within a lot of different types of development. So the way that you describe it seems to be a different approach. But it all makes perfect sense and it should be common sense to work with different actors and see who works with you and who won't work with you. So when do you think this idea will be not so much as an approach as all, and be mainstreamed as when you develop every single development project that is carried out? Well, I'm hopeful. It's, it's, becoming, <laughs> it's, it's, it's becoming mainstream and uh, I mean, there are a lot of international uh, NGOs who are interested? They, I mean, they start off by saying, "Well, actually, of course, this is what this is what we always do. This is what we've always done." But then, after thinking about it a little bit, they admit, "Well, actually, it's not when we what we do when we're receiving a large grant from a from a donor organisation. Then we start thinking in terms of a, a a fixed logical framework which is defined in advance, and then we report to them." Um, uh, uh, step by step as we move towards the result that we're supposed to be achieving. And some of them also say, well actually sometimes we achieve good results by being smart, by working in informal ways, thinking outside the box. Um, but that's not what we tell our funders. So that's, that's not the way we report on what we do. And we, we, in our team with ODI, we, we've had direct conversations with NGOs in Africa which who say we are doing useful work, but actually we don't report that way of working. So getting getting this into the mainstream involves, amongst other things, I think those practitioners who are working in an adaptive way need to come clean and go public. That that's what achieves the results. 